Good evening, everybody, and welcome to UPMC's first public webinar. And um, this evening, we're going to have a focus on men's health as it is November, Movember. And um, we're going to have two of our consultant urologists from the network and um, give you some information and education around um, urology. And um, just to let you know that UPMC network is fast expanding in Ireland. So we now have four hospitals in the group. UPMC uh, Sports Surgery Clinic in Santry, UPMC Kildare Hospital in Clane in County Kildare, UPMC Oteven Hospital um, in Kilkenny, and UPMC Whitfield Hospital in Waterford. Um, as we go through the presentation, um, you'll, you'll hear from our consultants, and at the end, they will take some questions for you. You will see there um, at the bottom of your screen um, an Ask a Question tab. So please keep the questions coming in, and the consultants will answer them at the end of their presentation. You don't need to wait till the end um, to ask the questions. You can type them in the box, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get them answered at the end of their presentations. We'd really, really uh, like to thank you for joining us this evening. And we're going to first of all welcome um, Mr. Siddiqui. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kashif Siddiqui. I'm a consultant urologist and have been asked to talk about men's health during this week by UPMC. Men are generally considered to be kind of ignorant about their health matters. You can talk to them about cars, about travel, but unlike women, they don't like to discuss about their health matters. But certainly, we need to be aware of certain things that we have to look after as we progress towards aging. One of the things that I want to focus on today is the prostate-specific antigen which is in simple words, is a blood test. It's a protein which is produced by prostate epithelial cells, both benign and malignant. And the function is to liquefy the ejaculate, enabling fertilization. It is present in semen, urine and blood. It is available in the form of complex PSA and also free PSA, which is not combined to any proteins. The PSA value changes with age, and according to the current National Cancer Care Program in Ireland, a normal PSA is 0 to 2 for all men between ages of 40 to 49. The normal range increases to less than 3 in men aged 50 to 59, which goes up to 4 in 60 to 69 and should be less than five in all men above the age of 70. PSA testing has been looked at as part of screening in multinational European and American trials, and it has not been recommended to use it as a tool of screening. However, many men these days are well aware of it and would, would request a PSA test and plus the diligent general practitioners have included this as part of the routine check after a certain age. The recommendation would be that PSA should be checked in men after the age of 50 and after the age of 40 in those who have a family history of prostate cancer or other risk factors, which include Afro-African descent, or first degree relatives. So if the patient requests, certainly I consider doing the PSA after counseling them. And there's a few things that we need to know about what can PSA lead to. We would always do their prostate specific antigen testing if they present with lower urinary tract symptoms. If they have an abnormal examination of the prostate, or in advanced cases of prostate cancer, they can present with progressive bone pain, back pain, unexplained anemia, anorexia, or weight loss. There could be cases of spontaneous thromboembolism or unilateral leg swelling, 
which is commonly called as deep venous thrombosis, and certainly a pelvic malignancy like prostate cancer should be ruled out in those situations. And plus also patients who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer and are on treatment or after treatment, we have to monitor their PSA on a regular basis. The counsel I recommend before doing anybody's PSA is that cancer will only be identified in less than 5% of men. So PSA testing does not necessarily lead to cancer diagnosis. It is very important to understand that its sensitivity is 80%. In other words, PSA comes from the prostate and nowhere else. But the specificity of PSA for prostate cancer is only 40 to 50%, which means that it could be high because of many other reasons. For example, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is something that I will address later on this evening. We need to inform our patients and you need to know that prostate biopsy could be uncomfortable. These days, the trend is moving towards transperineal biopsies, which are generally done under general anesthetic. But in many centers of UK and US, this is being done as outpatient procedure under local anesthetic, and it's only a matter of time that we will be moving towards it. The main advantage of transperineal biopsies is the reduced risk of sepsis. Previously, and even currently, there are centers which are doing transrectal ultrasound-guided prostate biopsies, which obviously run a risk of infection. And up to 2% of significant infection, so much so that it may require hospitalization. Repeat biopsy may be recommended. So once off, doing a biopsy is not enough in some cases. Treatment may not be necessary, and that would mean that even if someone is diagnosed with prostate cancer, they would be, or they could be, a suitable candidate for active surveillance or watchful waiting in elderly population. Treatment may not be curative because if the cancer is picked up at an advanced stage, you may need a multimodal treatment. However, in this current age, we have many treatment options now available. Prostate cancer management has changed completely in the last 10 years with many advanced treatment available now in Ireland and all over the world for advanced diseases. We need to know that there is a morbidity related to treatment, whether it be surgery, radiotherapy, or other novel treatments, which may lead to diminished quality of life. So doing a PSA may be the start of something that may end up in a very different manner, which the person requesting the blood test should be aware of. MRI scan has developed significantly. And now these days, it's a common practice to do MRI before doing the biopsies. Certainly the PSA blood test followed by MRI and then a biopsy. But where did the old style digital examination went? We know that the digital rectal examination for, of the prostate is very important because it increases the positive predictive value. It helps us to identify the abnormalities on the MRI and correspond it to our clinical findings. And in many situations, the clinical examination raises suspicion even with normal PSA. And that is why I think it is important not to let go this vital piece of clinical examination. As I mentioned earlier, that PSA is prostate specific, but not prostate cancer specific. And this is one message that I want you all to take home from tonight's talk. It could be high because of many reasons. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, 
is perhaps the most common reason, and every man will get BPH as they age. Histologically, after the age of 40, and anatomically, the changes start to happen after the age of 50. Urinary tract infections are a common cause of high PSA, and sometimes they could even go very high in the hundreds range where one would get very concerned that, am I dealing with prostate cancer or just as a simple thing as UTI? But you'll be surprised to find out that after treatment of the infection, the PSA falls right down within normal range. And that is why we recommend that PSA should always be repeated six weeks after the initial test before any definitive action is taken. Acute prostatitis is quite common in men of the age of 40 and 50, and that would be a common cause for high PSA in those men. Chronic prostatitis can also lead to that. Urinary retention, catheterization, instrumentation, all of those things can lead to high PSA values. Certainly the biopsy or surgical intervention on the prostate as well can lead to high PSA values. So the message that we need to take is PSA is important to get checked. We need to know as to what we are heading into and always remember that high PSA does not necessarily mean prostate cancer. As I mentioned to you that PSA generally increases with advancing age. PSA is used in management of prostate cancer in diagnosis and staging of prostate cancer, counseling and monitoring of prostate cancer patients. There are different numbers and it might be a little bit complicated to go through all the details, but in general, the values of PSA at different ranges mean different things for the clinicians. Because as the PSA goes higher, the risk of locally advanced disease, which means cancer going outside the prostate or cancer involving the other organs around it, is higher. Prostate cancer usually goes into the lymph nodes first and also the bones. And as the PSA value goes higher, the risk of spread, whether locally, in the regional area, or distant metastasis, which includes bone and lymph nodes in other parts of the body, is also very important. This is mainly for the clinicians to know the different values and make assessment accordingly. There are a number of things that you may come across during a consultation process with your general practitioner or a urologist or another physician. As I mentioned earlier, that PSA is available in the complex form and also the free form. And the free to total ratio, if less than 25%, is favorable. PSA density is calculated with the PSA values and the prostate size. And when the density is less than 0 0.15, the, the, the uh, uh, direction is towards benign conditions, whereas when the PSA density goes above 0 0.15, the concern is about cancer. What it means is that if there is a very large prostate gland, then even a rather high PSA can give rise to low density, which means low chances of cancer, whereas a high PSA in a small gland may increase the density and a high risk of prostate cancer. When we are monitoring patients, whether with prostate cancer or even during the time when the biopsies are awaited, PSA velocity certainly plays a role in our decision making. And the rise of PSA every year when it is more than 0 0.7 is considered to be significant. PSA doubling time after radiotherapy is also considered as an indication of intervention if the PSA rises very quickly to look at other novel treatments or alternative treatments in those who have had prostate cancer treatment. From here on, I would like to take you on to another part of male health, which is a number of symptoms that we would all experience as we age. And this would be related 
to the benign prostatic hyperplasia. Male lower urinary tract symptoms, commonly known as LUTs by us, the physicians. It is a complex composition of overlapping symptoms. And in general terms, these can be divided into the voiding symptoms like straining, terminal dibbling, slow stream, hesitancy, or even intermittent flow, or storage symptoms, which include urgency, nocturia, which is waking up at night to pass urine, and increased daytime frequency, or even the post-maturation symptoms, which is the, the dribbling that happens after the voiding flow is completed. It could be caused because of multiple conditions. And as you can see on the slide, that LUTs or the lower urinary tract symptoms is right in the middle of all these possible causes because they all present with different combination of symptoms. A single person may not necessarily have all the symptoms, but whether they have storage symptoms or voiding symptoms will direct our investigations and thought process towards different conditions. Some of the common ones in this are the benign prostatic enlargement or BPE or benign or bladder outlet obstruction, BOO. Like you can see that overactive bladder or detrusor overactivity, which is just the hyperactive bladder muscle leading to frequency and urgency. It is commoner in women, but can also happen in men, secondary to bladder outlet obstruction. As I said to you earlier, prostatitis is quite common in men. Bladder stones are an indication of bladder outlet obstruction. Bladder tumor can also lead to these symptoms, and that is why the necessity to, necessity to do flexible cystoscopy, or at least to look into the bladder, is important in assessment of lower urinary tract symptoms, particularly when there is blood present in the urine. Urethral stricture or narrowing in the passage of urethra or scar formation can also lead to slow flow, dribbling, and frequency. Any foreign body is, although it's thankfully not uncommon, but we do see it from time to time, can lead to symptoms related to infection, like frequency, urgency, burning. That, and then there are conditions like underactivity of the bladder or neurogenic bladder, which is to do with the nervous control of the bladder muscle. Nocturnal polyuria is a very typical condition where more than one third of the urine volume is produced at night time. It is slightly different to nocturia and may have other reasons to look into. The male symptoms are usually dealt with at the primary care in the first, at, at, the, at the beginning. Obviously, a careful medical history, which is always taken by the general practitioner, is vital to assessment, like I indicated before, that the symptoms related to storage, for example, going frequently or urgently or waking up at night, may mean just irritable bladder rather than an enlarged prostate. But if they have voiding symptoms more than irritable symptoms, which means slow flow, hesitancy, double voiding, all these would be signs of obstruction or benign prostatic hyperplasia leading to bladder outlet obstruction. Physical examination is done at the primary healthcare level. Urinalysis can be done. And like I said earlier, that PSA level is common enough to get done these days. In most cases, a medical therapy can be initiated. But if the symptoms don't resolve, if they get complicated, then obviously patients have to be referred to a specialist. And me as a urologist, we do certain other healthcare questionnaires to understand the symptoms better. We do a Euroflow study in which Qmax is the maximum flow rate, which should be at least more than 15 mils per second. 
It is important to know the average flow rate as well, the post-void residual, because if somebody is not emptying their bladder properly, then that can lead to frequency and also even leakage at night. Ultrasound of the upper urinary tract, which is the kidneys, is important because the back pressure of what is retained into the bladder can potentially damage the kidneys. And that is why the renal profile or the blood test for the kidney function is also done in these situations. Eurodynamics study is a very complex examination and specialized examination, which is not part of the routine initial assessment. It is indicated in very young or very old people with a combination of symptoms which could be misleading and mistaken whether they are because of the bladder or from the prostate obstruction. And as I said earlier, that endoscopy or the flexible cystoscopy is important to rule out bladder tumor and to assess other possible causes of symptoms from the bladder mucosa. This is just a depiction of what benign prostatic hyperplasia does, which every man would develop. And the his changes, as I said, start to happen histologically after the age of 40 and anatomically after the age of 50. On the diagram on the left-hand side is the normal bladder with the normal prostate in the yellow and a passage of the urethra, which is wide open through which the urine flows. But as you get older, you can see that the bladder on the right-hand picture becomes thicker because it is working over time to push the urine out through the obstruction, which is caused by the enlarging prostate, diminishing the space between the lateral lobes through which the urine passes. These symptoms obviously have a substantial health burden and men are quite bothered because it, as it starts after the age of 50, when they are working, when they are active socially, when they start to notice that there is some sleep disturbance, sexual dysfunction, they start to worry about it. It can have an impact on physical and mental health, but not only that, but it may have implications for the future as well. The symptoms may get worse or they can even develop complications. For example, acute urinary retention, which may require surgery sooner rather than later. Medical therapy can be initiated at the level of primary care. And usually the objectives are to improve the symptoms quickly and also along with that, improve the quality of life. It is also the long-term desire from the treatment to maintain symptoms at bay for a longer length of time and to reduce the prostate volume and the risk of complications, which I, as mentioned, are acute urinary retention, repeated episodes of blood in the urine or infections. The two drug classes that are available are Alpha blockers are commonly known as Tamsulosin, Zatral, Eurorec. You may have heard about these. They're usually initiated at the level of primary care as well. And the whole purpose is to block the alpha receptors which are present in the prostate lining to help with the urine flow. Or in the longer run, there are the dihydrotestosterone, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which decreases the dihydrotestosterone synthesis which in turn reduces the size of the prostate gland by reducing its sensitivity. There are drugs available with a combination treatment of an alpha blocker and 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, both at the same time, which has shown that there is reduced risk of urinary retention and other complications related to benign prostatic hyperplasia. As I mentioned, that the alpha blockers would work on improving the urine flow and the quality of life, and they usually start working pretty much straight away. But the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor take a longer time to start working. And at least it takes three to six months before any effect is noted. If somebody does not respond to medical th therapy, then there are a number of surgical options available. The surgical management is indicated in patients who show progression on medical treatment or present with complications of BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia, like I mentioned, acute urinary retention, repeated episodes of blood in the urine, infections, or even renal failure. 
if a person elects to forego a trial of medical therapy because they can't tolerate or they have issues with compliance to medical therapy. And then there would be those who would like to receive a more definitive treatment and get this sorted for once and for all. Surgical treatment can sort out the problem for longer duration, but many people would need a repeat surgery probably in 10 years down the line. The indications for surgery at the outset would be acute urinary retention or chronic retention due to prostate obstruction, which can which can present with renal failure, recurrent urinary tract infections or hematuria, which is blood in the urine, or bladder stones, which can which is usually formed because of prostate enlargement. Renal insufficiency or abnormal renal function can also be because of urinary retention. A bladder diverticulum, bothersome lots persisting after medical therapy, or indeed the patient preference are indications to go for surgery at the outset. The number of surgical options available, um, of which the transurethral resection of the prostate or TURP commonly called. Now we can do this with the bipolar energy as well, which is the transurethral uh, uh, vaporization in saline. Certainly the transurethral incision or the bladder neck incision is an option for younger men. The lasers are being used for many things these days. And in prostate, the green light laser is used for vaporization or the homium laser is used for enucleation for larger prostate glands. All of these are available in many centers across Ireland. Open prostatectomy is not commonly used these days for benign enlargement of the prostate and is reserved mainly for cancer cases. However, in some cases, rarely, we do have to revert back to this operation, which was invented by the by an Irish urologist and is still being done by some. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for listening there to Mr. Siddiqui and Mr. Siddiqui is going to take some questions now. Um, so the first question we have there is from Jared and he's asking, is there a more specific test than PSA called PSE available now? Uh, Jared, this is not available uh, widely. Uh, there have been other tests which have been used in clinical practice, but not available widely. And unfortunately, although you must have reflected in my talk as well, that PSA has a high sensitivity, but a low specificity, which doesn't make it an ideal test. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the only one which is available widely to the general population. And uh, we have a, another question in there from Brian saying, and um, what is the importance of the family history for prostate cancer? So the importance, it increases the risk, uh, Brian. And uh, for example, if you have one blood relative who has prostate cancer diagnosed, then your risk is almost twice as much as anybody else of your age in the community. But if the same number, if you have multiple blood relatives, um, who have prostate cancer, then your risk of having cancer yourself could go up to five times. So certainly that is important to know. And that also, keeping that in mind, the National Cancer Care Program and all the other uh, uh, authorities around the world as well, that they have brought down the age of people with family history of prostate cancer to start checking their own PSA at a much younger age. For example, in Ireland, um, we would do PSA yeah. from 50 onwards. But if somebody has got prostate cancer history in the family, they can ask for a PSA test from 40 onwards. Yeah. So that certainly can make a difference. And, and the whole idea is to pick up cancer earlier so that it is uh, treated well and can be cured. And I suppose, obviously, if at any age, if you do have symptoms... Um, uh, the indicative of um, uh, prostate complications, you will go go to your GP um, as soon as possible and and, and be reviewed. Yes, Gwen, uh, and and uh, the symptoms now with prostate cancer specific symptoms, uh, unfortunately, they appear very late. For example, with advanced prostate cancer, uh, with low risk early prostate cancer, the symptoms don't appear very early. 
but many of the GPs are now doing PSA as part of routine health check for the uh, for the eligible population. And certainly, if anybody goes them to them with lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, they would invariably get their PSA checked, and very rightly so. Excellent. And what are the surgical options for managing um, benign prostate? So, uh, like I mentioned briefly towards the end of my presentation, uh, previously we used to have the transurethral resection of the prostate, uh, which is use of a monopolar current. But now they are much better and also much safer techniques that are available throughout various hospitals, including uh, the, the UPMC uh, system as well, uh, because we can use laser. We have the green light laser, which is for laser vaporization. Uh, we can use homium laser for enucleation. We can use the bipolar transurethral resection in saline, which has got a uh, uh, which which has no limit to the time frame that it, the resection can be done, because traditionally the monopolar resection was limited to be done within the sixty minute uh, um, a time frame. But with bipolar resection, even with larger prostate glands, can be operated for longer duration without any major side effects or without any major complications. The TUR syndrome, the bleeding risks, the transfusion risk, all of those are reduced with these later newer te techniques. Um, the public must have heard about the resume treatment as well, which is the water jet therapy, which we are also using uh, as well. And, and that would be very helpful. And, and that's very, very effective in use in younger population uh, with lesser uh, sexual dysfunction side effects of that. So uh, these were the options which were all not available until about maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but now they're widely available and, and we have alternatives which are as good as transurethral resection in many ways. And I suppose it is important to mention that we, uh, across the 11 neurologists that work in the UPMC network, all of those treatment options are available, but it's very much bespoke to an individual patient and and and, and their condition. Um, so people may, uh, some options are available to some and not to others. So it is really about, you know, meeting with your consultant uh, and um, and deciding the best care plan with them. Yes, absolutely. Because, uh, for example, with the use of laser, the big advantage is that that can be done on anticoagulation. Um, and certainly, like you said, that uh, it's not that everybody is suitable for every technology. And that is why a hospital is compelled to uh, provide different options, uh, because they are for different patients with different uh, type of prostates and different type of symptoms. Uh, but it's good to have uh, the options available across the board and to be uh, to be able to to uh, offer those to to our patients uh, when we're dealing with benign prostatic hyperplasia. Yeah. And um, just one uh, more question, Mr. Siddiqui, a more general question in relation to preventative measures for prostate health. What role does health and nutrition play? So, Gwen, I think... Uh, as general as this question is, uh, I think general would be the answer because health improves the outcome of many diseases and avoids many uh, many illnesses to happen. Um, there were some studies done in terms of prostate cancer, but I'm not aware of any definite direct link which we can say with certainty to do or not to do. Uh, there were studies where obesity was linked to prostate cancer, where the outcome of treatment of prostate cancer was linked to obesity to have a worsen outcome. So certainly one should not be obese. Uh, there were there were studies that were looking at uh, uh, tomatoes, uh, selenium. Uh, there were studies looking at exercise and healthy lifestyle, which has shown to, to, to have some impact. So all of these general measures would have an impact in general towards your health and in turn also towards the prostate cancer. But the two major risk factors for prostate cancer are not related to diet, but they are more related to the family history and the African origin. And I suppose it is important to mention that, you know, if you do have a, a condition that needs a surgery, you know, your, your, your overall fitness, the better it is, the, the better you will recover from that surgery and the better candidates are for anesthetic. So just general overall health and, and well-being and looking after yourself, exercise and a healthy diet um, will help your overall condition and recovery from any procedures that you may um, require due to prostate issues or cancer.
Without a doubt, without a doubt. And that stands across the board along all the other illnesses and all other operations as well. Okay, listen, thank you so much, Mr. Siddiqui. Um, and just to remind everyone that if you do have any further questions, um, you can pop them in the um, Ask the Questions tab there. And um, we're going to move on now to uh, Mr. Lee Yap, consultant neurologist in UPMC Auteven and UPMC Whitfield Hospital. Um, and afterwards, we will take any questions for Mr. Yap. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Lee Yap is my name. I'm one of the new consultants in Waterford, consultant neurologists. And uh, today uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about testicular cancer. So just a little bit of background in regards to who I am. Well, I did postgraduate medicine at University of Limerick. Uh, I came through the Irish training system through the Royal College of Surgeons. And I did a master's then in healthcare informatics at UCD before going on a fellowship out to sunny Brisbane uh, and just returned back earlier on this year. I'm currently a consultant with the UPMC group in Whitfield and Ought Even. I have a public appointment in University Hospital Waterford. I'm also affiliated with RCSI and University College Cork. So recently back from Australia, like I said, out in Australia, I was working in the Princess Alexandra Hospital, which is the uh, largest tertiary referral centre in Queensland. I was involved in kidney transplant, as well as complex kidney cancers, uh, testicular cancers, which I'm obviously talking about today. And I trained also in robotic surgery uh, for prostate cancer. So into tes testicular cancer in Ireland. Well, we have about 175 cases per year in Ireland, and that equates to about seven men per 100,000. Uh, it, it is about 1% of all male cancers is made up with testicular cancer. So not hugely common. It's um, more than 90% are what, what are called germ cell tumors, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about in a few minutes. 34 is the average age at diagnoses, but the age range, you'll, as you'll see, is anywhere from teenagers right up to, to elderly men. Uh, one to two percent can be bilateral involving both of the testicles. But the good news is there's over 95 percent 10 year survival rate with testicular cancer. So high cure rates. But what are the risk factors for testicular cancer? One of the main risk factors is an undescended testicle. And uh, the, uh, the aim really for, for boys who have an undescended testicle is to bring it down into the scrotum, ideally at a younger age, between 18 months and two years is what the guidelines would recommend. And um, certainly if you can bring it down before the age of 10 years old, some of the research suggests that that will negate your, your testicular cancer risk later on in life. If you have a history of testicular cancer, you have a five to 10% chance of having a tumor on the other testicle at some stage in your life. Uh, if you are white and born in Northern Europe, unfortunately, you have a higher incidence of testicular cancer, particularly in places like Norway, Denmark. If you have a family history of testicular cancer, either a brother or a father, your chances of testicular cancer go up by about six or eight times. And also infertility or subfertility is a risk factor for, for this type of cancer. And um, we, we often see men have subfertility who, who come and present with testicular cancer. So really self-examination is a, is a key point to finding these cancers early. And I guess one of the main take-home messages is really to get, get to know your body and get to know your normal anatomy. And we would recommend starting self-examination from early, uh, early adulthood in, in your, in, let's say, in your mid-teens. Um, and it involves examining yourself ideally in the shower when it's nice warm water. The testicles tend to hang lower in the scrotum and you can, you can get a, a good feel of your anatomy, your testes inside the scrotum. And just to run through then some of the normal anatomy. You have a cord at the back of the testicle, which carries the blood supply, the nerves and the lymphatics. There is a separate little tube known as the vas deferens, and that carries the sperm from the testicle up to the ejaculatory duct. Often it can feel like a kind of firm piece of cooked pasta uh, at the back of the testicle. 
you have what's called the epididymis, which is the tubular uh, system at the back of the, or top of the testicle here. Um, this is made up of tiny little tube system. And if you actually stretch that out, uh, that would measure about 250 meters, which is really impressive. And the sperm travels down through that tube before it comes into the vas deferens. Often, Feeling the epididymis can be mistaken for a mass or a tumor on the testicle, um, but these generally feel uh, kind of moderately firm and usually separate to the actual testicle itself. And when, you, when we talk about testicular cancer, it's really here in the body of the testicle that we're most likely to find the testicular cancer. And this is where uh, your seminiferous tubules or the structure uh, involved in making your sperm um, uh, is, is stored. And often if you find a tumor, it'll feel like a hard mass uh, growing on this part of the testicle. So what should you do if you find a lump? Well, really, you need to go see your GP urgently. This is not something that you want to sit around and wait to see if it goes away. Uh, you need to go present to your GP. They'll often examine you and then refer you for an ultrasound if they think you need one. Um, and they'll often then as well refer you on to a urologist. If, if you haven't had an ultrasound done by the time you see us, we'll arrange for one to be done. We'll also take a blood test for what are called tumor markers. You will have a staging scan performed if we feel that there's a cancer there, which is a CAT scan. And we scan your chest, your abdomen and your pelvis looking for any signs of cancer gone outside of your testicle. And uh, we may end up booking you there for an urgent operation to remove the primary site of the tumor, which would be one of the, the testicles. Uh, at the clinic, we would of, often also talk about sperm banking. Uh, which is an option to uh, deposit a uh, sample of semen uh, to be frozen uh, for fertility uh, later on after your treatment. So, well, what does an ultrasound scan involve? It's usually done by an ultrasonographer in a private room, and they usually takes approximately 10 minutes to perform the scan. It's painless. They put some jelly on the scrotum and uh, place a probe on and uh, run the probe over the testicles, looking for any mass or abnormality inside the testicle. There's no radiation involved. So don't worry in that respect. It uses acoustic sound waves to pick up a picture. And uh, there's very, very good accuracy rates with an ultrasound. So if there's anything in there that shouldn't be in there, uh, the ultrasound should find it. Tumor markers, as I mentioned, are proteins or enzymes secreted by tumor cells and found in the blood. So it's a simple blood test uh, performed either in the clinic or at the phlebotomy department. And we use these tumor markers to help with the staging of a testicular cancer. It can also help in us predicting what type of tumor we might find. After your treatment, then it's help used uh, in monitoring your, your disease and whether it, any signs of it coming back. And it's also used in the prognosis uh, as to, um, depending on how, how high your uh, tumor markers are at the time of diagnosis. So testicular cancers, the majority, 95% are called germ cell tumors. And these can be broken down into two different types either seminomas or non-seminomas. The seminomas are usually in the uh, older gentlemen, uh, approximately 30 to 50 years old is, is the risk group for these particular tumors. They're usually slower growing, but they're very chemo and radio sensitive, which means they respond very well to chemotherapy and radiation treatment. There is a relapse rate, about a fifth of, of patients will have a relapse or a recurrence after treatment. The non-seminomas are uh, found more in younger males. It can be anywhere from late teens up to mid thirties. There are several different subtypes and depending on which subtype, they can be more or less aggressive. These tumors themselves are again, highly chemosensitive. So they're very, they respond very well to chemotherapy. Uh, about a third of patients with these non-seminomas will have disease outside of the testicle at the time of presentation. And uh, about 30%, unfortunately, again, will 
um, relapse uh, in, in uh, usually within the first year. So again, this is the A's dist distribution for seminomas and non-seminomas. You can see the blue, the non-seminomas more in the younger population and the, the seminomas usually found in the, in the slightly older population, kind of 30 to 50 age brackets, as I mentioned. In regards to mortality, while our mortality rates have gone down uh, over the last number of decades, the actual rate of testicular cancer has increased, but the, can the mortality rate has decreased. And that's probably due to better screening, better access to imaging, better awareness, and uh, better chemotherapy drugs, which, uh, which came on in, in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are very, very good survival rates with testicular cancer. These, this is the five year survival data. So regardless of whether you have a seminoma or a non-seminoma, the survival rate certainly at five years is in the high 90s. And uh, even at, at 10 years out, your survival rates are going to be, be in the mid to high 90s. So when we talk about staging for testicular cancer, there are three stages of cancer. Um, the majority of patients, about 60%, will present with stage one disease. And that is when the tumor is confined to the testicle and hasn't spread anywhere else outside of the body. Stage two is, is when uh, cancer cells have spread through the lymphatic system, which is the drainage system of the body. And that drains into a compartment called the retroperitoneum, which is where your big blood vessels called your aorta and your vena cava are, and uh, tumor deposits can grow there uh, in that compartment. And then we have stage three disease, which is more advanced, and that is when we have solid organ disease. And that's when disease is found either in the liver, the lungs, and sometimes even the brain. So the operations that we would perform for testicular cancer are really two, two operations. The first one is to remove the primary location of the, the tumor, and that's in the testicle. That's done uh, as a day case. It's called a radical orchidectomy. So we not only remove the testicle, but we also remove the cord right up to the, to the, um, to the incision site in the groin. At the time of doing the surgery, we would discuss inserting a prosthesis which is either a silicone or a saline filled artificial test testicle, which we can insert. And um, that's what they look like there. And we would size match those to, to match the other testicle. Um, patients recover very well after this, and we would just recommend not doing any heavy lifting for about six weeks. The other operation that we perform is what's called a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. And that's a big operation and it's to remove that tissue that deposits in the retroperitoneum, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. So we have to move the bowels out of the way and get into that compartment and, uh, and resect out that mass. Um, and about a quarter of patients after they've finished their chemotherapy will, will need to go on and have this type of operation done. Um, the, the, I guess the main long-term side effect, unfortunately, with this operation is it can affect men's ejaculation. And that's simply because the nerves that are responsible for ejaculation run down um, in the area where we're going to be uh, dissecting out that, that mass. And uh, when uh, testicular cancer spreads, it spreads through the lymphatics, as I mentioned. Um, some subtypes can spread uh, through the blood system, but the majority of them spread through the lymphatic system, which is the drainage system of the body. So how does this impact on fertility from men with testicular cancer? Well, as I mentioned, there is the opportunity to sperm bank, and this doesn't necessarily have to be done right before we remove the testicle. It can be done after the operation as well. Um, a UK study showed that only a quarter of men actually avail of the opportunity to sperm bank. Uh, and it's something that I would highly recommend to patients prior to any operation for removing a testicle. But even with that, uh, men at the time of diagnosis uh, uh, often have an element of subfertility. Uh, some studies suggest even up to a quarter of men have no sperm seen in their uh, ejaculate at, at, at the time of diagnosis. And up to half of men actually might have a low sperm count. 
So those men are unfortunately already on the back foot when it comes to fertility and um, they, would, they would benefit then from sperm banking. So if you undergo chemotherapy, it does affect your sperm production. That usually is delayed at about three months after you, your chemotherapy that you might start seeing your sperm count start to drop. Um, but, but any um, treatment-induced infertility can recover and usually recovers two years post-treatment. But unfortunately, this is a, for some men, it can impact on the window of when they might have been planning to have a family. And some guidelines would recommend that you shouldn't uh, start um, start uh, trying to have a family until 12 months after you've finished your cancer therapy. So, you know, combine those those together. That could be three years of a uh, time frame before you can you can get back to your to starting a family. So what are my take home messages from this presentation? Really get to know your anatomy. Check yourself in the shower uh, regularly. Um, Make sure if you have any, uh, any young boy in the family, make sure that their testicles are down. Uh, this is part of the, the uh, postnatal checks, but, but sometimes they can retract later on, even after they've done their postnatal checks. So if you have a small boy, just make sure next time you bathe them to make sure both testicles are down in the scrotum. Don't delay in seeking help. If you do find some abnormality, don't dig your head in the sand like some men do with their... Uh, their medical issues, go and see somebody, see your GP and get it sorted. Remember there are high cure rates for testicular cancer, regardless of what stage you're at, uh, stage one, stage two, stage three. It's very chemo sensitive um, and, and very good, very good long-term um, prognoses. And for those men who find themselves in the unfortunate position with testicular cancer, do consider sperm banking. Uh, that is done up in the Harry unit in the Rotunda Hospital. So we would refer you up there and they would provide this service for free and they would uh, freeze your sperm for a period of time for free. Um, and that really buys you time then and gives you peace of mind when it comes to starting a family, regardless of the outcome of, of your treatment. OK, that's all. That's all from me, guys. I hope you got something from that talk and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening and um, uh, take care. Good night. OK, Mr. Yap, so we've got a couple of questions here. Um, and right. so we'll get started with our first one. Um, do I need to have testosterone replacement if I have a testicle removed from Brian there? So uh, usually not is the answer to that. About 5 to 10% of patients who end up having a testicle removed may require um, some hormone replacement therapy with testosterone. Uh, for the small percentage of men that would have bilateral disease and in the unfortunate situation where they might have both testicles removed, those men almost certainly would require some, some testosterone replacement. But usually, usually for men um, who have one testicle removed, only about 5 to 10%. Um, and usually we only treat men who have low levels and are symptomatic. Uh, and there's various different ways we can deliver testosterone now. Uh, testosterone gels, which you can rub into your skin, uh, or more conveniently, there are injections which you can give every 10 to 12 weeks um, to replace your testosterone. Okay. I just want to um, go to Kieran's question there, um, just from, from the earlier um, Q&A. So um, Kieran asked, I've had two PSA Te uh, test six weeks apart, both levels have been 3.8. Should I be worried my age is 54? Okay, well, th thanks for your question, Kieran. So at 54, ideally your PSA should be less than three. Your, your GP has done the right thing in getting two separate uh, PSA checks, you know, six, at least six weeks apart. So you would meet the criteria to be referred on to see someone like myself in a urology clinic. And from there, uh, we would arrange for an MRI scan of your prostate. And the MRI scan gives us two key pieces of information. The first thing, it'll give us your prostate volume. And we can work out what's called a PSA density, which is the relationship of your, the size of your prostate to your PSA level. And um, the bigger the prostate, usually the, the more allowance we have for a higher PSA level, uh, which is still benign or non-cancerous. And the other very important thing that it'll tell us is the what's called a PIRAD score. And that's basically a risk score that our radiologists will assign to your prostate as to whether they think there could be a prostate cancer in there. 
and the score goes from a low risk at number one up to a high risk at five. And certainly if you have a score of three, four or five, the next step after that would be a biopsy of the prostate to sample some tissue from the prostate. So certainly I would not be panicking, but you do meet the criteria uh, to be referred on and, and see someone like myself at, at the urology clinic. And I suppose um, from, from a urology perspective with prostate um, diagnosis, the MRI has become a real go-to um, for, for urologists. And we here in UPMC, we do MRI prostate and we have consultant radiologists who specifically report um, on the prostate um, MRI scan. So there, there's no radiation involved in MRI, which is really important um, from a consultant prescribing a diagnostic, but also to have that specialist um, report on the scan, which which feeds into um, yourselves then in the urology department. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so um, just we have another question in there. Um, does a virus seal increase the risk of testicular cancer? So a varicose seal does not increase your risk of testicular cancer. Varicose seals are quite common, actually. About 20% of men walking around will have a varicose seal, usually on the left-hand side. Uh, a lot of them would be subclinical, so you may not be able to, to, you may not have any symptoms from it, and some of them will only be picked up on an ultrasound test. Um, the thing that a varicose seal can affect, however, is fertility, because it alters the temperature of the testicle, and uh, semen production happens at an ideal temperature, which is outside the your, your normal body temperature. And that's why the testicles can move up and down depending on how warm you are. It's really to optimize that temperature uh, for semen production. So the varicocele, which is veins in or around the testicle, can alter the temperature. So certainly if you're if you were having some uh, difficulty getting pregnant or some uh, some some issues around fertility, uh, we we would often then repair those to try and re try and restore the, the sperm production in that in that testicle. Okay, um, Pat um, has a question there. Could you clarify further relationship between undescended testate and testicular cancer? Yeah, so it's, it's probably the one main, I guess, modifiable risk factor or something that you can do something about. You know, you can't change, uh, you can't change where you were, your race, you can't change kind of where you were brought up. But um, the undescended testicle is probably the most uh, modifiable thing that you can ensure uh, to make sure both testicles are down in the scrotum. So about 10% of men, 10% of cancers that we find, uh, will, they'll have a history of an undescended testicle. And the main thing is that it's brought down early. The ideal age uh, for a young infant to have their testicle brought down from the groin, if it hasn't come down naturally, is, uh, is about 18 months to two years. Uh, the risk then uh, increases. But if you, if you bring it down, certainly before the age of 10, some of the data would suggest that then will, will negate your, your risk going forward of having testicular cancer. So for men, let's say, or for teenage boys who come and present, uh, or men even later on in life, and they end up coming to our clinics, uh, we still would bring it down into the scrotum. And the main advantage of doing that for them, it doesn't reduce their risk at that stage in their life, but it allows them to self-examine properly, to feel that testicle, and they'll know um, if there's any abnormality from, from being able to, to access it and feel it. Okay, thank you. And is there uh, any complications of having a testicular prosthesis? Yeah, so, so the, the, the complication rate would be very low for a prosthesis. They're made with either saline, which is salt water, or silicone. Um, they can be put in either at the time of the operation or even down the line, if, if the man has changed his mind and wants one inserted, we can put it in uh, after his, his primary um, surgery and even after his treatment. The, I guess the main issues that can um, occur with the prosthesis, uh, the uh, main thing would be an infection. So if you've got an infect infection around the prosthesis, you may require a course of antibiotics and the prosthesis may have to be removed. Uh, that that uh, can sometimes delay follow-on treatment if you need a chemotherapy, if you require that after a diagnosis of testicular cancer, um, which is not ideal. Uh, and traditionally, some people previously would have thought that we wouldn't put one in until they finish all their treatment. But we know the risk of infection is very, very low. So we'd still offer it at the time of, um, of surgery. Uh, and the other thing that can happen is they can migrate a little bit, particularly in the first few weeks or few months after they've been inserted. Sometimes you can, it can 
go up towards the groin. So you might have to milk it back down into a good position. Um, uh, and that can be a bit bothersome for some men. But, but overall, very, very low rates of, of complications with the prosthesis. Okay. Look, thank you very much, Mr. Yap, for um, taking our questions this evening and for your presentation. Um, I would just like to remind you all that you will receive a survey link immediately after uh, we've finished here um, where you have the opportunity to provide us with um, some feedback on this evening's session. We will be using your feedback to guide our presentations in the future. So if you found it helpful or there was aspects to it that you would like to hear again or aspects that you would um, that we didn't cover that you would like to know more about, please let us know. Um, and uh, thank you all very much for joining this evening.